Welcome to our beginning of the semester policy at McCombs. We're happy to welcome Ken Judd from the Hooper Institution, who will be giving us a talk on when will the Fed join the third millennium? Well, Here's thank you. T over to you, Ken. Yeah, thank you, TJ. Now, my talk is going to begin with this video of a bridge, which obviously is having some problems. And there's some idiot who left his car on the bridge. Um, now, uh, this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which by the way, well, I should say it was the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So this is a bridge built in um, 1940 um, and over uh, near Tacoma, Washington. And it was over a river, um, but there was, it was a gorge, so there was some depth below it. And so um, when, the, when they, when they final, finalized the construction, they started to notice that uh, the bridge would tend to wobble a bit. And then, of course, this happened. Now, how did that come to be? Because, you know, this wasn't the first time a bridge was built in um across a uh a river of that size um in fact you know by 1940 thousands of bridges have been built and uh this one uh collapsed now why well uh it collapsed because of the the wind there was wind um, that would come across down through the uh, river route and it would cause oscillations in the bridge. Now, by the way, this isn't the first time that they built a bridge where there was some wind to consider. No, 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 they knew about wind. And uh, so what, they knew that there was st possible stability problems. Um, so what they did is that, and, th and th this is what they did in those days. They, now, by the way, the equations of the wind are Navier-Stokes equations, fluids, uh, compressible fluids. Um, <coughs> and then also the equations of the bridge are equations from uh, structural mechanics. You have your stresses and your tensions, and then you have the, the strengths of the components, the concrete and the wires. And so you take, all, now that's a big messy system of equations. But what they could do, remember this is 1940, and what they could do is they could say, well, okay, let's find the stationary situation, the stationary state for the bridge when there's zero velocity of wind and the bridge is not moving. And then let's perturb this dynamical system with a little wind. So it's like the, the mathematically with just a little perturbation, linearization around the stationary point. And of course, linearization is just uh, like um, for small changes. So that's like if I went up to the bridge, went blowing on it. But, and so then that was a test they were using. And of course, the thing is that if you did the linearization and all the eigenvalues were stable, uh, less than, all the eigenvalues were less than um, one in norm, then you would conclude that it was stable. Of course, if you've got an unstable eigenvalue, you would say, well, no, no, that's not good because the unstable eigenvalue in the linearization would then lead to um, oscillation, explosive oscillations. But they figure, okay, we compute the eigenvalues. If they're all stable, we're fine. What happened here? They computed the eigenvalues. They were all stable. Something went wrong. What happened, and this took a while for them to figure out, um, what happened was that there had been uh, there had been some innovation in bridge building that was tried out on this bridge. The innovation was meant to reduce the weight um, and economize on materials um, without reducing strength. However, it did affect the profile that the bridge presented to the wind. So there were other oscillations that were set that were set up, and these were not expressible in were not present in the linearization. 
These were nonlinear oscillations, nonlinear elements of the dynamical system that wouldn't show up on a linearization. And so this then uh, was what happens. You have a dynamical system, you linearize, you say, oh, it's stable, but maybe it's not. Um, if, and now if it was just a little puffing, me puffing on the bridge, yes, it, would, it wouldn't go down. But if you have a steady and a str strong wind, um, and by the way, they knew how strong the winds were in, in, in this area, so they knew what they had to deal with. But um, they just stayed with that linearization strategy and, um, and they had misjudged it. And so um, now what does this have to do with economics? Well, in economics, what is the primary tool for judging the stability of a dynamical system? Linearization. So the engineers stopped doing this um, in 1940. Um, economists do it even today, 80 years later, even though there's no good reason for assuming that, um, syst that, you can, that the linearization is adequate for stu studying stability. Now, here's another, I like to point out that, you know, computation, doing good computation matters. And here's an example, here are well, three examples surrounding World War II. Now, on August 6, 1945, at dinner at Farm Hall, Farm Hall is one of these English um, estates, which had been uh, commandeered by the English government to serve as a hotel for certain guests. The guests, by the way, were the German scientists that had been involved in the German bomb project. And so then somebody comes in with the evening newspaper announcing that the atomic bomb had been exploded. Heisenberg's immediate reaction was, I don't believe a word of it. Hahn, Otto Hahn, says, I didn't think it would be possible for another 20 years. Now, how do we know that they said that? Well, this place was bugged or wired, whatever. I mean, they, they, the, the British intelligence services had put in, literally in those days, recording machines were wires. And so we have the actual transcript of that conversation. And this is what they said. And then we also have a transcript of what they said over the next couple of days when, well, then two days later, there's another headline of another bomb dropping. And they say, well, apparently this isn't just a propaganda joke. And then they realized that they had messed up on computing the amount of U-235 needed to make one bomb. They had thought that it'd be tons and tons of U-235. And it wasn't. Now then, um, in 1940, Dr. Yoshio Nishina uh, chaired a committee in the Japanese government to study the application of nuclear physics. And of course, the application we're talking about here was a nuclear bomb. Now, why is there all this activity? Remember, fission had just been discovered, I think, just a few years before this. That fission of uranium had just been discovered, and everybody from the very beginning knew, oh, this could be a bomb. <coughs> but the Germans looked at it and said, no, nah, no, nah, it's not practical. Dr. Yoshio uh, Nishina, a name I never heard of, but he was also well-trained at the, uh, he was one of the world's best um, um, physicists and in this area. And he concluded that it would probably be difficult for the United States to do this during the war. Be, be extremely costly. Again, the amount of U-235 that was needed. Well, we know that these two guys messed up. And now in the United States, the history was a little bit different. In August 1939, we had the famous einstein Zillard letter to FDR warning of the possibility of atomic bombs. A former colleague of mine actually helped write the letter and drive, drove Zillard to Einstein's summer home. Now, what's more important, you see, at that time in August 39, they would have also thought that it was going to be tons of 235 needed. However, in England, Frisch and Perils wrote a memorandum, and notice the date. This is 1940. This is after World War II started. So Frisch and Perils wrote a memorandum, which I presume then was secret, argued that 10 kilograms of U-235 would make a bomb, which means now we're in business for a bomb that could be dropped by a plane, and so we now know what happened after that. Getting the computations right is important. 
And another example, more up to date, uh, John Cochran in, in a uh, article once referred to the equations of general relativity as impenetrable. Um, now, this is the problem when economists starts talking about um, how difficult physics is. The fact is the equations of general relativity are not impenetrable. And in fact, the first generation of GPS systems critically relied on the ability to solve the equations of general relativity. If you, did not have, if you did not have those equations solved, GPS would have been worthless. And in fact, um, Desert Storm would not have happened the way it did. The only reason that the United States and uh, Schwarzkopf did the left hook business was because we had GPS. And that was the reason why the United States ended up with very, very few casualties because of that maneuver, which was a shock to everybody in the world that didn't know it was coming. So again, computation matters. These equations are not in, impenetrable. Now in the real world, almost everybody is using high power computation. Now I could, I could sort of go down a list of various people at Stanford that are using high power computation. No, I instead am gonna to point to two people I met um, while occasionally attending my wife's church. So, I mean, I go to my wife's church. I have more interesting conversations about computation than I go to a macro seminar, okay? I mean, that's just, that's the nature. That's how ubiquitous serious computing is. Marcus Covert, Covert um, published in Cell Magazine, Cell Journal, the top, top journal in that area, a paper that was described in New York Times he had a simulation of 128 computers um, that a cluster, and he modeled the complete lifespan of a cell at the molecular level. So there's, you know, within, within a cell, there's, he had 28 different systems. You had your mitochondria, you had your DNA, RNA, all that stuff. He had 28 different systems that he then had successfully simulated um, in a computer so that it was, it matched the actual living cell. And uh, there's other quotes that people did not think that this was possible at that time. He did it. And I hate to admit it, but he even did it using MATLAB, which I gave him crap for when I heard about that. But he had 128 computers and not in 2010. Now, um, more recently, a, a friend of ours, John Stevens, um, who founded a company called Heartflow, what Heartflow will do is take I, 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 it, they take a picture of the heart, an MRI or a CAT, CAT scan, one of those things. They take a picture of the heart. Now, by the way, it's a picture. It's, it's not a movie, but it's a picture. But from that picture, they will create a digital 3D model of the arteries in your heart. And given that 3D model, they will then simulate the flow of blood through your heart and see what the critical blockages of blood are. And so you can look at that, um, the results, and you can see which blockages are benign and which ones needed to be treated like with a stent or something. And the belief is that this will cut down the number of unnecessary stent surgeries by a half. This is just everyday business and science. Yes, this is in um, biology, well, medicine and in biology. This is how science is being done nowadays. And by the way, um, many years ago, there was a university-wide uh, um, project on computing at Chicago that was set up. There, there was a, a group of um, professors involved in setting it up. And from all the different schools, uh, parts of the university, there was, a, there was a sociologist that was involved in this. There was even a French lit professor that was involved in this university-wide advanced computing initiative. There were no economists involved at the University of Chicago in that initiative. So this just shows you just how much economists are behind and how they are so separated from the rest of the world when it comes to uh, using advanced computation. Now, let's look at some other, let's look at what the government does. Now I'm going to talk about the Fed, so let's look at what other parts of the federal government does 
with regarding comp com computation. Well, the NOAA, uh, Nash, anyway, whatever, they're the, they're the weather people. They're responsible for weather prediction, in particular for modeling hurricanes. And they do that. And so anytime there's a hurricane, that they track that hurricane and then make predictions about um, uh, where the hurricane is going to go. And all, always notice that it, it's a band. It's a band that's a growing band re representing something like a two sigma standard deviation or whatever. There's, a, there's some uncertainty quantification that's done. <clears throat> and then occasionally somebody comes along and you know adds on a little black marker if he wants to broaden the area. But by and large, these, these are the tracks that then are used to um, uh, advise people for um, um, what, where they should evacuate. Also, what's interesting is that they're not, the United States has a model called the American model. The Europeans also have a model of our hurricanes. I wonder why, but anyway. And so there's a competition between the two, and actually the European model often does better than the American model. But anyway, hurricane modeling is very, you want to know where the hurricanes are going to go so that people know um, where to go and where, where to get, get away from the hurricane. They spend a lot of money on, on computers there. Now, this is the big gorilla in terms of computing. Now, the mandate from Congress is that the defense, the, the US government defense establishment is demanded that they have to make sure, they are to make sure that US nuclear weapons will work if used. You see, we, the, the mandate is that if the president of the United States wakes up some morning in a cranky mood and wants to incinerate hundreds of millions of Russians or Chinese, add in a few tens of millions of Iranians, whatever, that he can go to his football, press in the codes, and in 30, 45 minutes, those hundreds of millions of people will be incinerated. We want, that's important to this country, that we want to make sure that those weapons will work if used. Now, by the way, Russia's doing it, also China's doing it. The same thing, the same kind of computer intensive um, uh, study. Now, why is this happening? Well, because in the early 1990s, people said, well, let's stop real tests of nuclear bombs. And it was then, the reason that that stopped is that everybody was confident that, well, computer simulations can tell us if our bombs are gonna work. So we don't need to actually really test them. Um, and so that's um, what happened. And then this is, the, this is the big driver for the money that goes into supercomputing in the United States. Um, now, this, another big driver are, are teenage boys and their video games. So, um, but I think that's sort of helping in terms of like taking the stuff that whatever's done for the bomb people and then making it more consumer oriented. Um, but anyway, this is a big driver. Um, of the push for um, supercomputing in the United States. Now, so, and so what are the computational challenges? Well, the DOE said that nuclear weapons simulations must extrapolate far beyond the available data and must predict coupled multi-scale physical phenomena that are difficult to isolate in experiments. So that's, you have multi-scale physical phenomena, extrapolate beyond, far beyond the available data. And that's what um, the charges to the Department of Energy has been told to do that. And under the Department of Energy, they have the administrator for nuclear security to develop this and carry out a plan to develop exascale computing. We don't have an exascale computer yet. Um, the, there supposedly is gonna be one um, built at Argonne. It should be it's supposed to, the Argonne um, is supposed to be able to turn on its exascale machine next year. Now, by the way, you say, you say that Argonne isn't that for peaceful uses of uh, computers and all that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, they're going to get this exascale computer that the, um, that the DOE wants and been mandated to do for, for um, uh, stockpile stewardship is what it's called. So now they take this seriously. These are the machines they use. A machine from about 10 years ago was called Skybridge. Now, when I first saw that, I was a little 
taken back by this because, you know, the villain in the Terminator movies, the computer that took over the world, was named Skynet. So, you know, it's funny, maybe this, you know, maybe Skybridge then becomes Skynet. Anyway, it was a little bit odd. Somebody there has a real sick sense of humor, is my, my guess. Um, and and his, his superiors never watched the Terminator movie. Um, now, more recently is a computer called Sierra. Now, notice they all look alike, yeah, but Sierra's a lot more powerful. Um, and you can find, you just go on, online, you can find all the numbers for this. And by the way, these machines, each machine costs, this, the cost of the machine is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And then, and then they eat up enormous amounts of energy. So that's a big cost. And also the thing is the number of people you need to run it is, is also very high. This is what we use to make sure we can incinerate hundreds of millions of people at, at, a, not at a minute's notice. Now, now let's look at economics. High-tech finance, for example. Financial businesses are using computational methods and hardware to price options, design financial products. They're data, using data mining to learn creditworthiness of borrowers. They're using um, <coughs> you know, neural nets, deep learning. And um, they're also using high-power computers to generate the information that they then send to the regulators. The regulators say, regulators say oh, is your portfolio safe? And oh yeah, we're gonna do these simulations over here. And, oh yes, yes, the, our portfolio is safe. Um, also, you have interconnected financial systems, very complex financial systems, and a lot of interactions. And so you, with high tech, we need to know how these pieces interact. Now, of course, everybody wants a stable financial system. That is, unless you shorted the market and then maybe unstable for a few months is okay. But anyway, so normally we both agree, behind the veil of ignorance, we all agree we want a stable financial system. Um, now, and the role of government is to provide property rights, um, set up the rules, capital requirements, for example. Also, it, the government decides which assets are safe and can be used to satisfy capital requirements and which are considered unsafe. Now, by the way, they don't always do that job perfectly, do they? But that's part of their job. And now government regulators rely on economic analyses somewhat, um, but you know, they, they have their own mandate. They could go beyond academic analysis if they wanted to. Um, and also what they really are trying to do is solve a problem in mechanism design, try to set up the rules of the game so that the game stays stable. Now, the US Federal Reserve is the agency that uh, certainly aspires to be the big boss. I know there's uh, others that uh, have some power, et cetera, but the Federal Reserve is, um, it's supposed to be in charge of price stability um, as well as full employment. And then lender of last resort is another more recent uh, task. <coughs> For example, last um, spring, they issued lots and lots of loans. And also the more, they more and more wanna get into regulating systemic risk and in financial institutions. Now. Suppose Congress had the same mindset for financial stability that it did for incinerating hundreds of millions of people. Then they would think that they would say this, oh, economic policy simulations must extrapolate far beyond available data and predict coupled multi-scale social and economic phenomena that are difficult to isolate in experiments. And so the complexity of economic problems make them appropriate for exascale computing. You know, actually, the thing is that, uh, you know, getting a bomb to work is much easier than getting an economy to work. And uh, also, how often, um, how often are nuclear weapons used? Um, twice, uh, 75 years ago. Um, but we seem to have economic collapses far more frequently. So this, this would seem to be a sensible view. Now, what computational tools does the Fed use? 
Well, the laptop is my personal laptop, which, by the way, at the time was a lot better than most of the laptops that the economists and the Federal Reserve have. Um, now, e I, have it to the, I have it open to the homepage of eViews. Now, as I tell the eViews people whenever I see them at the winter meetings, that I, I understand that they have a very nice product and it does a very good job for, for, for doing the things it's designed to do, which is time series analysis. eViews is one of the uh, descendants of TSP. Um, so, and I say, that's fine. Um, so I say, but so don't get insulted when I start ridiculing the Federal Reserve because what they do is they use this time series statistical package to solve the primary number one macroeconomic model that's used in the Fed called FERBUS, F-R-B slash U-S, FERBUS. That is the model that the Fed uses and some a few years ago, John Williams said, I said, is it people still using Furbus? And he said quite proudly that, oh yes, we take it into the FOMC meeting every week, or every every FOMC meeting. We bring in the, the Furbus. What what does Furbus say? I was a bit puzzled, shocked. Um and so this is what they do. This is their well, Furbus was created, the model was created in 1996. I think it was basically, they took some earlier stuff and uh, organized it, put it together and got it, coded it up in eViews. And so now the, um, the, the current version of Furbus goes back to 1996. Uh, 1996, that was 24 years ago. The model was made 24 years ago. It's partly a rational expectations model, uh, partly another reduced form kind of model. Um, it it ba ba basically boils down to, I think it's really perfect foresight. I, there's not much of a, they talk about stochastic elements, but I think in the end what they do is they solve out perfect foresight paths. It's, a, it's basically solve out a system of nonlinear equations um, but for those of you who know the literature, let's I think, say like a fair Taylor was a method to solve these dynamic macro systems, for example. And so they they used they coded up an algorithm in eViews to do this. Now I asked the guy who did this. I said, "No, why did you do this?" He said, "Well, because you could solve the problem and plot diagrams using the same software." which um, I, I, we, I, had a, I had an email exchange with him. And then as, as the email exchange went on, I think he kind of got the idea that I really wasn't happy with his choices. So he stopped replying to my emails. Um, because by the way, in 1996, you could have done this with MATLAB also. You could have done this with MATLAB and Fortran. You have a Fortran program that spit, does some computations and spits out some output file and then in MATLAB you can draw pictures. So this, the excuse is for using eViews is nuts. Also, what did he, when he wrote up the algorithm, he wrote up a very old method for solving nonlinear equations. Who wrote this code? It was some guy at the Fed. You'll see, you'll see his name. Now, now, um, now 1996, why was he doing this? Because the World Bank in the 1970s was doing general equilibrium with Fortran and people got kind of sick and tired of Fortran. So a group of those guys left the World Bank and formed some, a company called GAMS, which is very user-friendly software for solving, um, <coughs> for solving large systems of nonlinear equations. Um, and they could have done that because by the mid '90s, GAMS was a very well developed product. It it's the go every it has all the state of the art algorithms for doing optimization, for doing nonlinear equation solving, and for a variety of other things. Why not use it? No, 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 they, no. They don't want to use GAMS. Um, and um, 
The IMF, by the way, at that time was using Troll, which is a multi-sector model, as well as another multi-sector model of their own. So the IMF and World Bank were using far more sophisticated tools than whatever this guy did. And I like to point out that, by the way, this is not a problem of distance. You see, here's the Federal Reserve down here at C Street. And anyway, Federal Reserve, it's um, um, right across from the, from the mall. And then you just go up about four or five blocks and you're at the IMF and you go across a block or two and you're at the World Bank. So, you know, these, um, these, are, these, these people are all close together and I, I would think they occasionally talk to each other. But no, the, the, here's the difference. Um, IMF is run by foreigners. The World Bank is generally run by Americans, but remember one of the Americans that ran it was McNamara, who is famous for his um, uh, um, liking people who had OR skills. Um, but, um, but down here, this uh, Fed that's, only, that's run by Americans, Americans only. Now, some foreigners are allowed, but what's, what strikes me, in order to get a job at the Fed, you have to be either a U.S. citizen or a citizen of some country with which we have a defense treaty. So I have some Swiss friends who are very sophisticated, very good, very ideal for bringing computational skills to the Fed, but nope, they're Swiss. That's as bad as being Chinese. Um, maybe not, but anyway. This is also, now, 1996 was when it started out. This guy, Flint Brayton, wrote a paper in 2011 updating his 1996 code. And he talks about E. Newton, E. Q. Newton, and he does, so talks about quasi-Newton and Newton. This was all known in the early 70s. And this is, by the way, this was obsolete by the late 70s. So, this is, um, this is Ferbis. This is what your Federal Reserve is doing. Now, there occasionally are people in the Federal Reserve that realize uh, things aren't going so good. And um, John Williams is one of these. At the time he wrote this, he was just, uh, might, have, uh, might have been president or he's director of research. John Williams was a student down here at Stanford when, when I first came. David Reichschneider was an office mate of mine at the University of Wisconsin in the economics department. I don't know these other two guys. Um, so have, have we underestimated the likelihood and severity of ZLB? Yeah, of course you did. In 2011, we knew that. But they, here they give a list of, um, they say, well, we find the decline in economic activity and interest rates has generally been outside forecast confidence bound, bands of many empirical models, in particular Furbus. And why did that happen? Was it uncertainty about model parameters and latent variables, which were typically ignored in past research, significantly increases the probability of hitting ZLB. Wow, you have parameter uncertainty, <coughs> which is going to mean then, you see, see the thing is that hitting a zero lower bound is a tail event of a stochastic process. So you just take your empirical estimate of the stochastic process, you pin down that number and you simulate and you get a probability of the tail. Well, if, you're, if, you're, if you just have a guess if, if you, uh, for the parameters, if, there's, if it's a, you have fuzzy beliefs about the parameters, then as you express those fuzzy beliefs, that tail is gonna get bigger. That's just uh, trivial, simple math. So by ignoring the standard errors in estimating your parameters, you underestimate the um, probability of hitting ZLB. And uh, now, by the way, I don't know why it took them until 2011 to realize this, um, but it did. Now, this is an example of what um, some of us would call uncertainty quantification. That in economics, we estimate something, we estimate a model, and then we examine the implications of that model. But we have to realize that the parameters, our parameter estimates are themselves noisy. 
Now, down in Texas, uh, a former Texan, uh, uh, a Texan, yes, he, he's still there, um, is famous for responding. He was um, President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson. By the way, LBJ stands for Lyndon Baines Johnson, not a basketball player in my book, okay? So um, he, some, he asked for some prediction from some economists, and the economist said, well, we can give you a range of predictions. He says, ranges are for cattle. I want a number. So, and uh, that's, um, you know, what I guess, not that that was the result, but anyway, that was certainly was the attitude of econ economists. Still, still is the attitude of economists. Don't give me ranges, give me numbers. A number. We got, uh, if you don't have a number, it doesn't have economic content. Uh, I had a paper rejected in 2014 for the sole reason that I looked at uncertainty quantification, that instead of just picking one value vector for the, for the set of parameters, I had looked at alternative estimates that had been in the literature. And they said, oh, because of that, there's no economic content because it could be this or that, you haven't been precise. So that still is the attitude in um, journals today. And I'm talking about a top five journal, not any other. So, so the thing is that these guys, yeah, they, they had uh, done the LBJ approach, just they had forgotten about the fact that the, you have a range of values for your parameters. And that's one of the reasons why yeah, DLB came, um, hit us. Now, I don't know. Now, this is 2014, like I said, 2011, 2014, a major economic journal rejected the paper solely for the reason that we had done sensitivity analysis on the parameter estimates. Um, now, now, when you're in this kind of situation where the Federal Reserve wants to set up rules, but it doesn't end up for a system that's complex, What should it do? You know, Hartport talks about solving millions of equations. Whereas if you look at Furbus, the Fed says that a problem is hard if it has hundreds of equations. Hartport, this, the company that's taking pictures of your heart and analyzing blockages, they have millions of equations. The Fed thinks hundreds of equations is hard. Colbert talks of interactions among 28 different systems of a cell at different time scales. The Fed's models just assume a couple interacting systems. And by the way, at quarterly time steps, some parts of the economy operate at far shorter time period, but everything is put into this quarterly time step. And so, um, and they do the models on laptops. Give it given the primitive nature of their tools, how can you regulate other than just doing something simple and basic, such as Glass-Steagall, such as those um, rules that were strict and clear and you had China walls between this part and that part, whatever. Um, the um, when you, when you don't have uh, in, in, uh, information analysis tools to do something sophisticated, you just really have to deal with it simply. Now, by the way, in Furbus, Furbus at one point it says, oh, we have all these equations we have to estimate. And it says, they said, oh, we can't estimate the whole system because there's too many variables, too many parameters. Now, by the way, that sentence was there in 1996 documentation, and it's still there in the documentation. Too many variables. Well, in the over the past 24 years, computing power has gone up by over a million. My, I have just for the fun of it, I take my latest um, iMac. I randomly generate a 20,000 by 20,000 dense matrix and invert it in 45 seconds. I don't think there's 20,000 parameters in Furbus. I'm pretty sure that's, I mean, that's too many. I mean, so 
they said it was true back in the 1990s that, oh, there's too many parameters to estimate the system as a whole. Because back then, you maybe a system of 100 or 200 is all you could do on a, on a computer then. But today, my iMac can do, can could estimate a regression system of with 20,000 parameters and do so in 45 seconds. So that's just another example of how <coughs> the Fed is stuck in the second millennium. Um, now, are things going to get better? Well, for some people there. Now, I happen to be acquainted with three particular guys who got their PhD at Stanford and then went on to be involved in monetary policy. One was Volker Wieland. I was at, uh, John Taylor and I were his uh, PhD committee. Um, and in his PhD thesis in the early mid 90s, <coughs> he solved a five dimensional dynamic programming problem. And, um, but then um, more recently, <coughs> he gave a paper at a conference talking about the US tax reform. By the way, if you're not an American and you're going to write a paper about an American tax reform, you really should know something about the American tax policies, you know. Um, but Volcker wrote down this trivial model with one sector, one kind of group of people anyway, and then tried to model the 2017 tax changes into that. And um, I reminded him that uh, the United States is um, far richer than in his model. Um, now, another guy I knew, um, wasn't on his committee, but I knew well when he was a student here, is John Williams, whose paper I referred to earlier showed he, was pres he is now president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Done very well. He's done very well for himself. Now, um, and I, could, I saw in 2017, I saw why. He is very well-spoken. Oh, yeah, you put him in a room of uh, people and uh, in power and, and influence. And he does, he's a very good talker, very good talker. Now, in this one presentation, he made a comment about how, oh, we need models combining monetary and tax policy analysis. Now, people like that should not make those comments if I'm in the room. So I, I said, okay, I'm gonna ask the question. I said, okay, Mr. Big Shot, you're the president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve. You have lots of money that you can use for research. Why not build such a unified model at the Fed? And then of course, the backtracking starts. Oh, oh we got, there's lots of things we gotta do, this and that and this and that. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden this uh, grand vision just uh, disappears. I, he did not mean that he really thought that there should be a combined monetary and tax policy analysis. Um, somehow he thought he could get away with it. Um, now, and so he, now, by the way, Volcker is, he's one of Germany's five wise people. Um, and he certainly has connections with the ECB. Uh, John Williams is um, president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. I'm saving for last the best. Bo Lee was, uh, he was an RA of mine for a couple summers back in the 1990s. He got his PhD in economics here. I think his advisors were, were Mitch Polinsky and um, Paul Milgram. Then he went on, he got a law degree at Harvard, then he got an internship at a big fancy international law firm in New York City, and then he went over to China. And um, for several years, I think this job ended about a year and a half ago, but for several years, he was the Director General of the Monetary Policy Department of the People's Bank of China. Basically, he was the Chinese person corresponding to the Chairman of the Federal Reserve. He was their Powell, whatever, for those many years. Now, he was here a couple of years ago, um, gave a talk, and then he and I spoke for oh, oh, well over an hour about a variety of things. And, uh, and 
he understood, you were talking about that time, the, the US tariffs against China were important. And so we talked about how to model that. He knew how to model it. He knew there's multiple sectors. He knew you couldn't just aggregate everything. He understood that you needed general equilibrium models. And in fact, he was, um, he knew about some efforts at Tsinghua University. And um, I had the impression that if I volunteered to join, I, I could have joined in and, um, and helped them. But um, anyway, so no, this guy, Bo Li, knows the value of serious computation and multi-sector economics and doing things in a more sophisticated fashion. So um, on the basis of that, I would say short the US and bet on China. Uh, Germany doesn't matter because they'll just follow whoever's winning. So, um, but you know, so that's, it's kind of ironic that those three guys are guys that I knew when they were students and now they are um, high, at high levels of their um, respective um, policy authority. Now, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna quote people. See, people in the Fed, they're very careful about what they say generally. But there are people that are associated with the Fed that are affiliated with it that, you know, that the people in the Fed listen to. So for example, Sargent, <coughs> he's on this Python kick. The kind of economics I like to do if you can't write a Python program, you're a bullshitter. Yeah, well, I, I, I took that as kind of personally offensive because I've been writing programs to do things long before there was Python, you know. And by the way, those programs that are gonna nuke the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians were not, are not written in Python, but they still, they're still gonna work. Um, he might be referring to, he had, he had a bad experience, a JPE paper of his that used Fortran uh, was all garbage, um, but that wasn't because of Fortran, it was because of the math. But this is something that economists often forget about. They say, oh, I've written my code up in a new language. Actually, this is done at the Fed, oh, at the New York Fed, they have some model that they like and say, oh, we've now written it in Python. Yes, oh, it's faster. Yeah, but so what? It's faster. So you get to a bad answer more quickly. Anyway, now there's an, an OR person, her husband told me this, who says, economists are so far behind that soon they will not be able to catch up. <coughs> now, why is this? Well, here's another little story I like to tell. I was at a, I attended a conference where a Columbia University macroeconomist uh, wrote down some model of, oh, exchange rates and all this money and all that. He wrote down a linearization procedure and found that his model had unit roots when you linearized it. And he, he was happy with that. He was happy with that. I pointed out to him that if a linearization of a nonlinear system produces unit roots, you know nothing about the stability of the system. You have to go to higher order derivatives in order to determine that. And I point out that I learned that in the late 70s when as a graduate student, I was reading papers by ben, just Ben Habib. Now, he also in his talk was saying about how, oh, you know, macro models are so hard to solve. He was almost pulling his hair out. I think he has, yeah, he has hair. Um, it was because of all, how painful it is to solve that the model the equations that come out of macro models. <laughs> I point out that he was he came out to um, Hoover Institution flying on a plane from New York City. The equations that were used to design that plane were far, far orders of magnitude more complex than anything any macroeconomist has written. So uh, so I was then tempted led to ask him, what are you doing so that your students can solve models that you can't? <laughs> His answer was, well, I guess I'll tell him to go down and talk with Jess Ben Habib, who's at NYU. This professor is at Columbia University and Jess Ben Habib is at NYU University, both in New York City. Um, and so I guess he figured, well, if, if a Columbia University student has a tough time, he can just get on the subway and go down and talk to Jess. Now, this is typical Ivy League behavior. You know, if a student has a hard problem, tell him to go to somebody who doesn't have an Ivy League degree to help him um, solve the problem. Um, I've had that happen to me. Now, so, you know, just brush it off. However, now the speaker, Richard Clarida, is now federal, vice president of the Federal Reserve. This is the attitude 
of the most academic, the top academic in the Federal Reserve System. He doesn't care about the math. He doesn't care if you linearize a nonlinear system, you get unit roots. Uh, he doesn't care that you should, in order to analyze stability, that you should do higher order derivatives. No, he doesn't care about that. No, no, no. That's not important. Is it important that people at the Fed be able to solve models that his students can't solve? Well, no, he's probably just calling them, telling them to go call Ben Avi. Um, I Anyway, but that's the attitude of the top academic at the Federal Reserve System today. See, Powell is not an academic, and so I guess that's one reason why Clarida was given that job. But, you know, that is the attitude at the Fed among the academic people. <clears throat> now, um, okay, I have some other stories to tell you. Um, the best one, I think, is this. Vivi Chari is, he's a professor at the University of Minnesota. He's also a, um, affiliated with the Minnesota Fed. Now, in 2010, there was a congressional hearing on DSGE models. Yes, Congress investigated DSGE models. Yes, yes. Um, but it was, it was like most of those things. It was kind of a, a, a sort of a show and tell kind of a show to, <coughs> to deal with some bureaucratic headaches. Um, it was a background. But anyway. So there were five macroeconomists that were um, invited to talk about DSGE models. Um, most of them were hostile. Solo was hostile. Um, in particular, I think it was Solo's comments in general that were prompting this. But Chari was the gun guy that was appointed to defend DSGE models. And so he starts talking about him. He says, you know, you can't put everything into a model. And so he says, abstraction, which incorporates features of the real world, Okay, model, okay. Models are abstractions which incorporate features of the real world thought to be important to the policy question and leaves out details unlikely to affect the answer much. Now, I have written down many models of dynamic economics of perfect foresight. However, I have never thought that I had perfect foresight regarding what details um, I shouldn't put into a model in order to, to get a robust finding. Um, this is called research. Consulting is where you know the answer, by the way, you know, it goes in and, and what's going to come out. That's consulting. But research, you don't know what's going to be important. You don't know what's going to be unimportant. Wouldn't it be nice to have tools to separate out the important and the unimportant? Now, then he goes on to say that abstracting from irrelevant detail is essential given scarce computational resources. He said this in 2010. In 2000, my, a student of mine had a 2008 thesis, thesis which used um, computing power at the University of Wisconsin. He had, a, um, he had parallel, he'd done some parallel computing across 200, up to 200 workstations. And this was free stuff, free computing power to us. Um, and there were supercomputers around. Um, <clears throat> but then um, <coughs> we didn't have the, but then in 2010, based on Kai's thesis, we got a six million, partly based on his thesis, we got a $6 million NSF grant. Um, and the promise was that we had the money to then go and put his stuff, dynamic programming on supercomputers. And over the past several years, I've used millions of core hours, didn't pay one penny. Um, so where does Chari get off saying that scarce, that computational resources are scarce? Um, and in 2010, that wasn't true in 2010, certainly not true today. The resources are there. And I give a list of I have a list of people of people who have shown that uh, you can do you can um, there there are serious computational resources <coughs> available if you go looking for them. But macroeconomists 
don't even go look. They just assert that there's a scarcity problem with computational resources. And then to tie this off, he says, not to mention the limits of the human mind in absorbing details. So let's go. Models have to abstract from things that we don't think are going to be important because computational resources are scarce and the human mind is very limited in absorbing detail. Now, yes, there are limits of the human mind in absorbing detail. Has that limit been approached in macro at the Fed ever? No. I've gone to some supercomputer conferences and there I see, well, well yeah, that, that, that's hard to understand, yes, but no, part of the power of computing is to make it easy to understand, is to test what matters and what doesn't matter, to, to examine um, uh, what assumptions, what, what changing parameters will do. I once, I saw him um, um, uh, for lunch um, a few years ago and I asked him, now, which minds were you describing? Uh, the look on his face said it all. I mean, he realized that that probably wasn't the smartest thing to say. Um, but anyway, here again are just people who have been doing sophisticated things um, using high power computing. So this is the, now, by the way, you might wonder, well, how relevant is, basically, the thing is that, oh, no, I'll get, I'll, sorry, I'll get to this. Right here is the point. Now, tomorrow I'm gonna be talking about a, a project on climate modeling that I've done. And it's the model called the SICE. Um, and so basically it takes the dice Nordhaus model and then adds all sorts of uncertainty to it. <coughs> now, it's dynamic programming. Um, it's a big dynamic programming problem. However, everything that was designed so that all it, that it's anything that is a difference equation in a Bonnock space can be solved by this. So this, this can handle pretty much any macroeconomic model you've ever seen. Because every macroeconomic model is basically a, a difference equation in a Bonnock space. Um, and so we use the, be the best available numerical methods. We could add in new methods as they come, come around. And also we've done recent, um, a bunch of papers. Tomorrow I'm gonna to talk mainly about the JPE paper. Um, but no, uh, we've done this. Um, so it's, no, it takes, you've gotta have access to computing power, yes. Um, you've got to know, you've got to know some computational mathematics. Yes. You know, you got to know what you're doing. Okay. Um, but this was, um, given the problems we had, this was a major success that we got this far. And like I said, um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, millions of core. I forget. I think it was like, I think it was like twenty or twenty-five million core hours over the past seven years. Um, I, there were times when I am sure that uh, the there is more computing power being used in those hours to solve our uh, climate problems than were being used by all of academic economics research at the same time. Now this is a computer we used, Blue Waters. Uh, it was the um, flagship or NSF um, scientific supercomputer. Um, it has, um, as with all these supercomputers, they have a life cycle. They are born and then after a few years, they're obsolete. So then um, you pull the plug on them. Uh, th this Blue Waters found somebody else that, will t that took it over. Now, <clears throat> so, Supercomputers are used in the United States and other governments. Now, by the way, the, I don't know of any serious use of big computers in uh, Europe in economics. <coughs> but you have to remember that Europeans have been brainwashed into thinking that they've got to, got to get American um, PhDs, that they've got to get published in American journals. 
So they, um, they're just crippled by this um, attachment to the United States that they, for some, I don't know, there are historical reasons for this. Um, I like to tell them, look, the United States came over to Europe to, to free you from oppression, not to impose our oppressive demands on you in our ways. Um, but they don't listen. I mean, it's just the, the tight grip that American academics has on Europe is well, particularly strong in economics. Um, but basically, supercomputing is used in engineering and any, I even talk, uh, told you about some, some, but some people in literature using it um, for text analysis. Uh, so economists are about the only group that are not using it and are really viciously opposed to using it. Um, and this has filtered in to the government agencies also. Um, like the Fed makes no effort to educate the researchers. The IMF actually is better. You go to the IMF and then they, they have some courses. They try to teach you some things that they want you to know that you didn't get in graduate school. <coughs> so, um, so the main problem is that uh, um, academics, academic macroeconomists uh, are in charge of the Fed is the main problem. Now, but I want to emphasize something that at the University of Texas, you have a unique advantage. Stampede 2 um, is a supercomputer. One of the, again, another one of the National Science Foundation supercomputers. You've got it there on your campus. And if it's on your campus, that means that it's easy for you to get time on that machine. I say easy, it's easier, basic and, um, now, by the way, my experience is with these universities is that you show up and you ask for a, a supercomputer time and you tell them you're an economist and they, their eyes cross and they, they're going to make you jump through some hoops and um, prove that you can actually do something because they aren't used to economists showing up. But you just go through the hoops. You just go do the, take the stupid little courses. I had a student at Boston University who wanted to, needed to use a, 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 a machine that had 64 gigabytes of RAM. And so they made her go some, take some courses or whatever. And then fine, she got, got through it. But so you guys have Stampede. And the thing is that if there's a supercomputer on your campus, the campus in negotiating the contract with the university, <coughs> with, with the government always basically puts in special features to make it easy for U University of Texas people to get on that machine. And, uh, so you have that on campus. You can, I can't, there's nothing I can get here at Stanford. Stanford doesn't have anything. And if, if let's say, so the, if the computer science department has something, they don't share it with the rest of the university. Um, it'd be great if, you know, I'd love being someplace where I had students who could then go to these um, big machines. Otherwise, instead I have to spend my time uh, telling people how to struggle through with MATLAB on a small cluster. Um, but no, you have that machine on campus. Use it. Um, now I don't, you know, I don't know what the rest of your infrastructure is. You, in order to use it, you need some computer science training, some computational math training. Um, but you have the machines there. And you should, you should use it. This, this, this student of mine at Penn State, if I could get her to on like Stampede, her job market paper would be done quickly. We wouldn't be having to wait for all this headaches with MATLAB and all that. Um, so you've got the power there. You can use it. This is one reason why I want to give this paper at UT. You guys have the power on campus. Now, you know, you, you know bureaucracy is always a headache. You got to find some way to, you know, you got to look at all the fine print of how to get, what the different kind of applications to make. And um, because they never make it easy, but I guarantee you, there are features, there are ways for you to get in there. And by the way, one reason I got so much time on Blue, Blue Waters was because I was like an affirmative action case, because I'm an economist. 
there were no other economists that wanted time in that machine. And so Blue Waters liked that because you see, Blue Waters depends on funding from Washington, NSF. And so if they can, so the, the way to get more money from Washington is to tell them about the, your broad constituency of users. So they look at me, yes, you're a weird duck. I don't care about anything you do, but we give you a few million core hours and I can put that in our report. And now that's real money for me. So the thing is that, you, you know, yeah, they're going to sneer at you, but what you got to do is get that message to somebody who thinks, who thinks at the, at the top level that yes, having economists use the stampede is good because, and that makes them look good to whoever writes their, the checks. Anyway. So anyway, so this is, <coughs> I've given you sort of a rough <coughs> overview of these issues. The Fed is a, the, the Fed is a bad example. I mean, it, it's, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it basically, it does not really want to do the research on what the kind of research they need to do. And, uh, and it's all an in-house operation. They don't want to hire people to come in for a while and, and on a consulting basis and teach their people how to solve models or how to set up a computing system. No, it's, it's all in-house. And uh, they don't, they don't like to bring in outsiders and well, who, who, who's going to work for them? Who's going to work for them? Um, people who know the, the computational math, well, are they going to want to go to the fed? No. So the fed is a closed shop and this is killing it. Well, anyway, thank you for listening. Now I hope some of you have comments, questions, yeah, um, opening this up in the chat. And if y'all want to put some questions in the chat, we'll read them off and Ken, you can answer some questions. I also want to say that we do have a talk by Ken tomorrow morning at 10 AM, um, which will be on, as he said, his climate, uh, paper, which will be talking more about supercomputing in climate policy. And so the first question here, does the set of analogies, so by Richard here, does the set of analogies, bridges, cells, nuclear bombs really hold in macro? Even with computational limits, is the micro to the point where you can actually write down a plausible system that captures the underlying economic activity driving the data? Okay, now, I don't know how, you know, the thing is how, how deep you want to go in terms of um, how much detail you want to add, but I will tell you this. Um, several years ago, there was a guy who um, had a PhD in computational astrophysics um, from some Swiss university. Um, and he, um, and he knew that he could have gotten a postdoc, but he knew, you know, all these guys know that their life expectancy as a physicist is rather short. So he decided to end it and then he worked to, he went to work in Zurich at some bank. Well, he was a scientist and then the bank, working for the bank was just too slimy for his taste. So then after two years of that, he was desperate to find something else to do with his life. So he got, got in touch with a couple of friends of mine at the University of Zurich, uh, Carl Schmetters and Felix Kubler. And so, you know, they were skeptical about this guy. And I said, well, I'm going to be in town um, in a couple of weeks. Let's have lunch with him. And by the way, send me his PhD thesis. So they sent me, I got a copy of his PhD thesis. Now, I don't understand the physics, but I could recognize the mathematics and I recognized the computational methods. They were computational methods for solving partial differential equations. And also he had done some uh, um, expansion, also he had uh, some work on expansions. Um, so he knew how to solve partial differential equations. He knew about expansions. So I told Carl and Felix, I said, this guy knows the kinds of computational tools that we need. 
So then Felix was, he's always the one who has the money. So Felix hired him as a postdoc. And, um, and this guy's name is Simon Scheidegger, who, by the way, did get a paper in, in econometric a couple of years ago. And he's also, he's um, worked on with Larry Kotlikoff on solving a um, you know, overlapping generations model, which is, um, you know, the Kotlikoff's overlapping generation models are like 80 dimensions in size. Um, so, um, so no, it, 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 you know, that, that, that you can't go to infinite amount of detail, et cetera, uh, but having 80 age groups is better than having one. And, um, I think that also the, the, the current, uh, climate stuff he's doing with Larry has multiple sectors. Um, and so, no, that, that was a case now. If he had been a, if he had been a, a particle physics guy, and I saw if I saw things like SU two and all that stuff, I would say no, forget about him. He doesn't know anything we need. Um, but you know, the thing is that yes, there's a lot of physics and engineering, basically the partial differential equation stuff, which is exactly the same mathematical tools that we need. And also, and Simon in particular had the parallelization skills that could be exploited. So yes, you've got to be careful. You can't just take anybody that has a physics PhD, but you look at what they're doing and the math kind of equations, and um, and if it, it and a lot of it matches, and um, so that's an example of I think a success. I mean, he's he's got a job now in Lausanne, but also he's like a, a, a visiting fellow at the Yale Economics Department. So, um, so no, he's, he's, he, he was a success in terms of recruiting from outside economics. Now, so I don't know if that, how well that answered your question, but that's, I think, a, a very good answer to the question I would like you to a ask. <laughs> there is always, of course, limits as to how deep you can go. But um, my point is we can do a lot better than the two second sector, three sector models um, or the other thing that bugs me all the time is, uh, one of my favorite lines, uh, at a, at a macro seminar is this, uh, they, I say from your accent, I can tell that, you know, that the United States is not the only country in the world. So why are you looking at a closed economy model? Um, closed economy models, uh, are, in many contexts are just absurd. Um, the great recession was not a closed economy phenomenon. Um, so, um, no, we can do far, far better. We can, uh, and capturing the second part of his question, but if it's capturing all of the relevant data, is the model good enough? Well, okay. Any model is limited by the data. If you don't, if you don't have enough if you don't have the, all the data you need, then yeah, it can only do as, as, as good a job as the data will allow it. Um, so um, now, by the way, the, um, you know, you, we, in, in econometrics, for example, you have times when you have missing data, you could do the, you know, do similar kinds of filling in the blanks kind of stuff. Anyway, um, see, the easy case for me for me is to say, look at the models that these guys are solving and look at how bad a job they're doing. They're just doing li log linearization. They aren't even paying attention to the fact that um, there's none about the nonlinearities. Um, so even the models that they're studying, they're, they're not really solving them. Um, but I, uh, my, my ambition, my, my belief is that we can go beyond just doing better on whatever the stuff they're doing is. So we have another question. How do you get people to want to work at the Fed in, so how do you get people to want to work at the Fed in my undergrad? The professor found that if you get a PhD, why would you go there? As it seems like for many, as that's a dead end on the academic side is way more appealing. Um, also, 
when you look regionally, it's worth looking past the 28 super sectors with small regions, some sector, they don't even exist as an availability. Yeah. You have to make judgments about, you know, look at the problem and include the sectors. You, you have to make some judgments. But I think I'll, what I want is make it, have a lot of those judgments come from the an analysis of more complex systems. And, um, and then you decide, well, okay, that's not important, we drop it. Now, okay, the, the Fed is successful at attracting people. Um, um, and it's not, it's not a dead end. There are many people that have, that go to the Fed and then later go to academics. Um, Ed Green uh, is one. Ed Green invited me to visit him at the Fed oh, this is in the 80s. And then after that, he went to University, University of Pittsburgh and then uh, Penn State. So, um, and Ann Seibert also was at the Fed when I was visiting there and she went to academics. <coughs> um, so no, it's not, a, the Fed is not a dead end. Now, that is one of the problems, however, because the thing is that the Fed wants you to do current research. They, they bait, to succeed at the Fed is the same as succeeding as a professor, assistant professor, or associate professor. They want you to publish articles in journals. So my attitude is, well, you're at the Fed. Why, why shouldn't you be doing things more related to the Fed? Why shouldn't you be involved in building a, a good model instead of the Fed using the Furbus? So the thing is, the fact is that uh, the Fed is very much of an academic job. Now, different Feds differ in terms of who's there, and the level, the caliber of the research that's done and the support from um, the management. Uh, Minnesota is the one that has this long reputation of being very academic, um, others less so. So the Fed, what, there are 14 Feds or 12? Four, anyway, there's a variety of Feds. Some are much more research friendly than others. Um, but the thing is that uh, a Fed job is nice in that uh, it's just like being an assistant professor, except you don't have students. Occasionally, you may have to be involved in making up a presentation um, to some big shot or something. Um, so no, it's um, and it does. It, as far as academics are concerned, it, they don't hold it against you. I mean, they just look at what papers you published and where they were published, and that's fine. So. Well, I appreciate your time. And I think we'll end here unless there are any more questions that we, oh, we have one person raising a hand here. What question? Oh, I think we lost them. All right. So, well, appreciate your time, Ken. Thanks for okay. coming out and giving this talk and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you.